This Parsha podcast is dedicated in honor of a brand new baby, Pesach Yehoshua Younger. May you grow up to be a giant tzaddik, and may you be a bright, shining beacon for the entire Jewish people. Our Parsha begins with a very interesting mitzvah, the mitzvah to give the first fruits to the Kohen. This is one of the 24 priestly gifts that are given to the Kohen. Of course, it's a great gig if you qualify. And the Torah outlines a very unique process for this particular mitzvah. The first 11 verses of our Parsha delineate everything that happens. And it begins by telling us, when you come to the land of Israel, the land that Hashem gives you as an inheritance, and you possess it, and you dwell in it, and you take from the first fruit, and you put it in a basket, and you bring it up to the place of God's choosing. You bring it to Jerusalem, to the temple. You come to the Kohen. The Kohen, of course, is the priest in the temple. And you make a declaration. You tell him, I, I've come to the land that Hashem swore to our forefathers. He takes the basket. They put it in front of the altar. And then the bringer of the bikurim, of these first fruits, makes a very lengthy declaration. And he starts talking about the history of the Jewish people. He starts talking about Laban, the father-in-law of Jacob, and all the terrible things that he wanted to do to Jacob, and how the Jewish family eventually migrated to Egypt, and they came in a small number, but eventually burgeoned into a great numerous nation, and we were mistreated by the Egyptians, and they tormented us and oppressed us and afflicted us, and we cried out to God, and God heard our prayers, and he heard our afflictions, and he heard our travails, and he heard our oppression, and he took us out of Egypt, going through the entire backstory of the Jewish people. And of course, this declaration doesn't seem to have anything to do with the mitzvah of the first fruit. It's not exactly clear why this particular mitzvah is given this very unique procedure. And the person continues, he brought us to this place, he gave us this land, the land flowing with milk and honey, and behold, I brought the first fruit from the ground that you have given me, and I shall lay before Hashem your God, and thus concludes the declaration, and he places it before Hashem your God, and you should be so happy, and rejoice with the goodness that Hashem your God given you, to you, to your household, to the Levite, and to the Ger, to the foreigner, to the proselyte. It's a very interesting process that we don't really see very often that we're told to do a mitzvah, to bring the first fruit, to give it to the Kohen. But there is a lot of pomp and circumstance surrounding this particular mitzvah. When you enter the land, Hashem gives you, it's an inheritance, you possess, you dwell in it, you take the first fruit, you have to put it in a basket. There's a lot of details that are unique. There's a lot going on in this story, and it makes us wonder what is the secret behind this particular Mitzvah. Now, there's a very interesting midrash. In fact, it's one of the first midrashes that you'll find in the entire book of midrash, and it tells us something striking. It says, right at the beginning of Genesis, the Almighty created the world. Well, if the Almighty created the world, the next question we have to ask is, well, why did the Almighty do it? Intelligent beings only do things for intelligent reasons. Why did the Almighty create the world? Says the Midrash, the first word of the Torah is beracious in the beginning. And every time you find the word racious, beginning, the first in the Torah, that's actually hinting at one of the things that is the embodiment of why God created the world. And our Parsha tells us, you take the first fruit, the racious fruit, says the Midrash, oh, Beratius, the first word of the Torah. And here in the book of Deuteronomy, all at the end of the Torah, it says that you take the first fruit and has the same word, Reshit. Oh, you should know that this is one of the mitzvos that really encapsulates the reason why the world was created. So clearly, this is not just an ordinary mitzvah. Of course, no mitzvah is ordinary, but this is not a run-of-the-mill standard mitzvah. There's something very unique here, and the fact that the Torah has this very unusual declaration is, of course, noteworthy. And reading it, it's kind of hard for us to understand what the big deal is of taking the first fruit, putting it in a basket, bringing it to Jerusalem, giving it to the coin, etc. So Rashi in verse 3 tells us that this mitzvah, the root, the core of this mitzvah, is about appreciation. More specifically, not to be an ingrate. 
to appreciate. The Almighty gives you fruits. It's the first fruits. It's the first yield of the season. And you're so happy with this. And you dedicate this to God and to his representative, which is the Kohen you bring to Jerusalem. This is a mitzvah that really tries to reinforce a very central principle of Jewish life of Torah that we have to appreciate all the goodness that the Almighty does for us. So, of course, that's a central element of our spiritual worlds, and maybe that's why this myth is so unique, because the essence of it is appreciation and gratitude and not to be an ingrate, and that is something that we should make a big deal about. That, of course, is a very legitimate understanding and framing of this mitzvah. I saw this year a mind-blowing essay by the Arachaim, one of the great commentators on the Torah. He explains this entire mitzvah and this entire narrative on a different dimension, on a Kabbalistic and arcane level. And this was so fascinating, I said, I'm going to share this with the wonderful Parsha podcast family. Now, there's an important introduction, and that is that we know that the Torah is multidimensional. Every word could be understood, says the Talmud. There's 70 facets of Torah. So there's 70 different angles prisms through which you could see and experience and absorb and digest Torah. So, of course, you read it on a simple level. It's talking about a man who has an orchard or has some fruits, and he puts them in a basket and brings it to Jerusalem. And that, of course, is undisputed. However, we know that the Torah also, the same words that can be understood on a simple level, can also be understood on deeper and deeper and deeper levels as well. And they're both true on different dimensions. So the Arachaim, the great commentator of the Torah, he goes through this entire episode and he explains it on a different dimension. He explains how the whole episode is, on this, of course, Kabbalistic level, is an allegory hinting at what happens to us after we die. Now, I want to be crystal clear here. This is not to insinuate that this verse or these set of verses are to be understood solely on the allegorical level. Rather, Given that there is multidimensionality in Torah, and on a Kabbalistic level, we're told here there's another way to read this whole episode. Now, long-term listeners know how I shy away from discussing Kabbalah in my podcasts. A, I don't profess to be an expert, and in general, I was trained to try to sidestep the mystical and the arcane. And as an aside, for more on why I generally avoid Kabbalah, you can listen to the two-part series on the history of Kabbalah that you can find on my Jewish history podcast called The Jewish History Podcast with Rabbi Yaakov Walby. Nevertheless, despite my general apprehension at talking about Kabbalah, this particular piece is such a mesmerizing piece. It's so neat and clever I figured it's worth dipping our toe into it and to see what we could learn. And as always, my email address is rabbitwilby.com. I'd love to hear from you. And if you want to support my podcasts, my work, you could support our organization, Torch. The website is torchweb.org. Okay, so let's see how this narrative hints at the Kabbalistic level. So we have the first verse. It will be when you enter the land that Hashem your God gives you as an inheritance and you possess it and you dwell in it. So we're told that you're in the land. Which land? The land that God gives us. He gives it to us as a gift and as an inheritance. And we possess it and we dwell in it. So he starts off the Archaim by commenting that there is no joy or no complete joy in this world. We, of course, believe that we're here temporarily and there's an afterlife. And there is what's called Olam Abba, the next world that is really the permanent world. By contrast, this world is a temporary world. And he points out that we can only truly be joyous in an eternal world. And he quotes sources to that effect. And this is a very joyous description, both because the Parsha starts off, Vihaya ki savo, and the word Vihaya, and it shall be, always connotes great joy. But the final verse of this narrative says, you shall rejoice. So there is unbridled joy in this episode. So the way it's explained is 
that this is referring to now when you enter the land, the land of Israel, kind of on a simplistic level as we would read it. But on the Kabbalistic level, it's a reference to when someone enters the higher level of a post-mortem paradise of Olam Haba. And then he points out, the verse tells us that God gives it to us, but it's also an inheritance. And in Hebrew, words are a little bit neater, but to give something connotes a gift, whereas an inheritance is something that you may have done something to earn. So the way he explains it is that when we earn our portion in Olam Abba, when we get reward in this next world, it is both a gift that the Almighty gives us, but something that we also nominally earn. Why? Because our deeds and our choices that we make in this world, they contribute to whether or not God gives us reward in the next world. Ultimately, it's a gift because the input that we put in is infinitesimally small compared to the reward that we're going to get compared to the output. And therefore, ultimately, it's a gift, but it's a gift that we do a little bit of a contribution towards and therefore it's described in these multiple ways. Moreover, you dwell in it. In Hebrew, via shavta ba, you should sit in it. And that's exactly how the Talmud describes olam ba. It's a world of sitting, of resting, of consumption. So we're just starting off this whole narrative. And we're being told that on this Kabbalistic level, like on this allegorical level, we are talking about what happens when man dies and goes to the other world, to the afterlife, to the eternal life, okay, you have my attention now. Verse 2, and you take the first of every fruit of the ground, and you bring it to this land, the land that God chooses, but first you put it in a basket. What is it describing on this tabulistic level? You're gathering fruits. You're stockpiling something. You are preparing fruits and you're bringing it to the place of God's choosing. This is a reference. This is symbolizing the mitzvos. What happens when someone dies? What do they bring with them to the next world? Of course, their material assets are useless to them in that world. However, we can, in this world, earn the currency that is useful in the next world, and that, of course, is the mitzvos. These fruits, the fruits of our labor, shall we say, are things that we can actually stockpile here and bring there. And this is the land that Hashem, our God, gives us. That motif is found elsewhere in Jewish literature. The verse tells us that God owns everything. The land, the sky, the heavens, everything above, everything below. And then there's a second verse that says, oh no, the Almighty owns, so to speak, the heavens above, but then he gives us the earth below. So which is it? Does God own the earth or do we own the earth? Says the Talmud. When it says that the Almighty owns the earth, that's a reference to what the state is before we make a blessing. When we make a blessing, we are acquiring, so to speak, this earth. Meaning, God is the creator. He owns everything. Can we become owners of anything? Here's the answer. The Almighty gives us something. He's giving us this land, these fruits. When we do a mitzvah, we actually acquire something. It's kind of an astonishing idea. What we own, what we think we own, what's in our bank account, the assets that are listed under our name, that's still God's. Ultimately, he created it, and we haven't acquired it yet. A mitzvah. That is actually spiritually acquiring something, and God's going to give something that was initially his and give it to us. And you place it in a basket. This, says the Orachim, symbolizes 
the idea that mitzvos have to be done in a certain format. And he explains that the word tena, the Hebrew word for a basket, the numerical value of the gematria is 60, and there's 60 books in the Talmud. And what this is hinting at, says the Arachayim, that if you do a mitzvah, but you say, I'm going to do the mitzvah the way I decide, I'm going to determine the rules and the regulations of the mitzvah, then you don't have the mitzvah in your basket. It's only the mitzvahs that you do in the prescribed methodology of Jewish tradition as outlined in the books of the Talmud of the Mishnah, only then do you have it in your hand. And he says a very sharp line, if you do a mitzvah, but you don't have all that preparation, it is futile. And then when you get to that world, you think you're carrying mitzvahs. Oh no, this is his words, not mine. You and them, i.e. the person bearing those mitzvahs and those mitzvahs themselves are going to be burned. A very scary idea that Torah mitzvahs, they have eternal value when we do them, not just the general idea the way the Almighty tells us, but the specifics and the implementation, the details the protocols as outlined in oral Torah. And then he says something fascinating. You take the basket, you fill it up with your fruits, and you go to the place that Hashem your God will choose to make his name rest there. This was something new to me. He says that there are two different, so to speak, paradises in heaven. When a soul dies, or the, no, the soul doesn't die, but the person dies and the soul is liberated from the body, the soul goes to the lower paradise. And then it's there for a while, and it's scheming and plotting to try to get to the next level. I had always thought, okay, if you're in the afterlife, if you make your way through the door, you're in. Here we find out, and this is based upon the Kabbalah of the Zohar, that once you are in, so to speak, this post-mortem paradise, you're still striving to get to the next level, to the higher level, to the place, so to speak, that God will choose to make his name rest over there. And he says that some people take them a day, some of them it takes them a week or a month or even longer. And that's the ultimate destination. That's the ultimate goal. And by the way, I took a peek at the Zohar. He says some really interesting and hair-raising descriptions of what is actually going on there. But that was interesting. So this is not just going to heaven, as we would say, this is going to the highest level, the zenith of heaven, the higher paradise, that is where the upcoming events are going to happen. So you're carrying your basket, so to speak, your proverbial basket full of mitzvahs, and you come to whoever will be the Kohen in those days, and you make a declaration. Who is this Kohen? Says the Archim, of course, again, on the simple level, it's just the Kohen, the priests, the people who are running the temple. But on this Kabbalistic allegorical level, there is a heavenly priest. And he quotes the sources that say that Michael is actually the current high priest in heaven. And the verse actually says, the priest that is in your days, meaning that Michal does not have that post forever. It's not a lifetime appointment. And there may come a time that there will be a different priest. But right now, it's the Angel Michal, and he is the high priest that we're going to present, so to speak, our mitzvahs to. And then he adds something which I thought was really cool. Oh, and you should know that Michal, the angel Michal, when did he get that post? When was he promoted to become the high priest of heaven? He was promoted when David died. So that's already a long time, and he has been in that position. And you make your initial declaration, and you say, I declare to Hashem, your God, I've come to the land that Hashem swore to, to our forefathers to give us. This is when you're coming to that next level. And the Kohen shall take the basket, this is verse 4, and lay it before the altar of Hashem, your God. And again, he points out only the things that are, so to speak, in your hand. That's a reference to the oral Torah, the tradition. If you do the Torah without referencing the oral Torah, well, then it's not really yours. It's not in your hand. And that would not be sufficient. Now, he doesn't mention it, but the Talmud actually says that the first recorded near-death experience 
one of the great sages died and was resuscitated. And all his colleagues tried to debrief him afterwards. They say, well, what did you see in heaven? And one of the things that he says, I heard in heaven the message was praiseworthy is he who comes here. Vitalmudo biyado. And his Talmud, his Torah study, is in his hand. The idea of having these missiles in your hand has to be portable as something that you actually are able to oversee and to take with you. I think the deep point behind this is that only Torah that changes us can actually be efficacious on our behalf. You can't bring books to heaven. You can only bring yourself. If you, if your being is bearing Torah, then your quote-unquote basket is full and you've got a chance. And here's where it gets interesting. You should call out and say before Hashem your God. So this is almost a description of someone's reckoning with God. You're now in this higher level of paradise and now you're going to have to defend yourself, defend your actions. And what do you start off with? Arami Oved Avi, an Aramean, which we're told on the simple level is a reference to Laban, the father-in-law of Jacob. He tried to destroy my father and he descended to Egypt and he lived there temporarily, few in number, and then he burgeoned into a great nation, great, strong, and numerous. What's going on over here? So the word that describes that you should call out, ve'anisa ve'amarta, that word connotes humility. This is someone who is actually having an audience with God. And you have to defend yourself. And who could actually defend themselves? Who could say that they have executed their duty and defend themselves in front of God? And he quotes a very scary teaching in the Talmud. The Talmud says that if God came with the strictest degree of judgment against Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the great heroes of Jewish history, even those giants could not withstand the scrutiny. So if Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, if they're being judged to the fullest extent of the heavenly law, they're going to fail. What do small people like us, what are we going to do? What chance do we have? So right away you start humbling yourself and you start apologizing for the paucity of your good deeds. And then you identify the cause. Arami Oved Avi, this Aramean destroyed my father. Of course, Laban, he's the Aramean, but he symbolizes the Yetzahara. Laban, of course, was cunning and deceptive. And who else in Torah is described as cunning and deceptive? Of course, that is the primordial snake. And the Yetzahara is that snake. He's wily, he's a trickster, and he's always trying to deceive us. And he destroyed my father. That's a reference to the original sin of Adam. Ever since Adam, our father, the father of all of us, ever since he capitulated, we all have a Yetzirah. We all have this wily, cunning enemy within us that is trying to destroy us. And then he gives a different explanation. Our father, again, on this Kabbalistic level, can also be a reference to our soul. And quotes the Kabbalistic literature that describes the soul as a father. Our soul, the holiest, purest thing that exists in this world, became corrupted as a result of the Yetzirah. And he descended to Egypt. The Hebrew word for Egypt is Mitzrayim. And that word can mean either border it could also mean pain. This force descended to Egypt. It's a reference to the fact that the Yetzhara, this wily, deceptive, cunning force, descended and became borders, neighbors, so to speak, with our body. He found an ally in our body. And this axis of evil, if you will, began to focus on all kinds of other things. 
So we're trying to defend ourselves in front of God and we're saying, well, why didn't we tend to our spiritual side? Why didn't we prioritize the Almighty's agenda? Why did we waste our time with all these worldly pursuits and we right away identify what the cause is? We have this force, this Aramean force, the Aesara. It comes into our body, becomes partners with the body. And now we have this evil union of the body and the Aesara being weaponized to force us to sin and to forget what we're living for. And as a result of that, our body became corrupted. And then he explains that the word Mitzrayim, Egypt, also means pain. We have been suffering. Our soul has been suffering because it's been forced to live in proximity with a body and with desires and with sin. And it's suffering lingering consequences even after its passing. But that's just the beginning. The Aramean, the Yitzhara descended to Egypt and he sojourned there. He started off maybe, wasn't planning on staying that long, but then he got comfortable. He started off really small, few in number. And before you know it, he becomes a great and mighty and numerous nation. The Yitzhara it makes a small incursion, so to speak, into our essence. And before you know it, it burgeons, it metastasizes, it grows out of control. And before you know it, it's running the show. And then he quotes something, this was mind-blowing to me. He says that when we say on Yom Kippur, we're asking God, forgive my iniquities, because it is great. He quotes the Arizal, who says, it is great, not that my sin is great, but the force instigating my sin is great, i.e. the Yitzhahara is great. And then he says, this is also mind-blowing to me, that on Yom Kippur, we have the scapegoat. We have two identical goats. One is given to God, so to speak, on the altar, and one is thrown off a cliff in the barren wasteland. What he's saying, the way I understand it, is that the Yetzirah, because it starts off, of course, as an outsider, it becomes great and numerous within us. It becomes so large and fearsome. And like we've said in the past, the Yetzirah is the false god, the fake god, the fire god. But he becomes so intense, so strong, that there is a certain measure of equality between God and the false God. And then, on Yom Kippur, in the spirit of repentance, we have this showdown. We have identical goats, and we have to choose which one of these equally, so to speak, powerful in our hearts, masters, which one of them do we want to follow? Do we really want to follow the God, so to speak, of the scapegoat, the false God? Do we want to worship the false God? The Yetzirah starts off as being kind of feeble and weak and flimsy. But before you know it, it grew out of control and it took us over. And then we read about what happens. The Egyptians mistreated us and afflicted us and placed hard work upon us. Our soul got corrupted too. We is a reference to our soul, our essence. And because of the circumstances, it wasn't just that the person, the collective union of the person started sinning, the Yetzirah, the body, the soul also got corrupted. And he says a very deep idea. A person, of course, is not just a collection of entities, body, soul, Yetzirah. It's one thing. It's one unity of man. And when a person... Sins, what actually happens is that the soul also partakes in it. And before you know it, sins become an acquired taste for the soul. The soul, this tremendous force of heavenly power, unbridled power and purity and energy, suddenly becomes like a body interested in all kinds of depraved and certainly material and physical pleasures, things that it would eschew and even revile in heaven where it comes from. The Egyptians really did damage to us, and they tormented us. 
and they afflicted us, and they caused us difficulty that was unending. Our soul got exasperated. It got deflated. There was this constant unyielding submission that the soul had to suffer at the hands of all those other forces corrupting it. These are the excuses that the soul presents to God in this higher level of paradise as excuses for the paltry offering that he has to show for his life. And then we read in verse 7, we cried out to Hashem, the God of our forefathers, and he heard our voice, he saw our affliction, our travail, and our oppression. If we want to succeed against the Yetzirah, we have to cry out to God, we have to pray every day for success. Of course, the Almighty created the Yetzirah for a noble purpose, but when he sees the devastation that it unleashes, he hears our prayers and he points out that it says our affliction, our travail, our oppression, these are various different impacts that the soul has on us. It overwhelms us. We have to struggle with it. We feel compelled to it. But God hears our prayers. And then in verse 8, Hashem took us out of Egypt with a strong hand, with an outstretched arm, with great awesomeness, and with signs and with wonders. The Almighty gives us the tools to overcome against Sahara. He's going to aid us in our battle against this fearsome, wily, Aramean enemy. And quotes the Talmud. If God didn't help us against the Yitzhara, we would have no chance. But he gives us a strong hand. That is a reference to Torah. And then it continues. Great awesomeness, signs, wonders. This is a reference to various mitzvos. Tefillin, tzitzis, mezuz on our door. The Talmud tells us, if someone has tefillin, and tzitzis, and a mezuzah, they will not sin. These mitzvahs are specifically designed, of course, every mitzvah ultimately helps in this in this war, in this campaign. But these three particular mitzvahs are designed as ways to thwart the Yetzer Hara. They quote something really cool. The word mezuzos, which means plural mezuzos, if you unscramble those letters, you can actually create the word zuz maves. Death escapes. We could escape from death. The power of the mezuzah is so strong that it stands at our door and swats away all those things trying to attack us. Yes, we have a fearsome enemy, but the mighty hears our prayer and he's going to help us. He gives us Torah. Of course, Torah is the great antidote against the Yetzirah, and gives us mitzvahs that are designed to allow us to maintain our purity, our innocence, our holiness. And then we read verse 9. He brought us to this place, and he gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Again, he points out that there's two places being referenced. He brought us to this place, and he gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. These are going to reference for these two tiers of paradise, the lower paradise, which is, again, symbolized in a land flow with milk and honey, and the higher place, the higher level of paradise, which is this place, which is that ultimate climactic pinnacle of the soul's experience. And now, behold, I have brought the first fruit of the ground that you have given to me, O Hashem, lay before Hashem your God, you should prostrate yourself before Hashem your God, and... The final verse is, you should rejoice with all the goodness that Hashem your God has given you and your household, you and the Levite and the proselyte who is in your midst. Continues the Arachayim. This is a description of Olam Abba. You bow down before Hashem your God. There is an experience that is unrivaled by any experience we have in this world where we could actually connect, so to speak. We could have a relationship an unvarnished relationship with God, and that is the experience of Olam Abba, where a soul can recognize and understand its creator, that is the acme. After we defend ourselves, so to speak, and we emerge from this encounter with God, 
so to speak, victoriously, we are allowed, so to speak, into that universe and concludes the verse. We can rejoice with all the goodness. We have access to all the goodness. Of course, the Almighty wants to do good. This world, the good is kind of a mixed bag. But ultimately, the real life, the real world is the world that we're trying to get to and we can access it. It's still a gift, of course, because no matter how good we are, we're not actually deserving of it. But they might say, give us the gift if we put in the effort. He points out that God is to us and to us alone. We have it and not the angels. And then he ends off with some nice flourish. God gives it to us and to our household. Us is our soul. The household is, so to speak, the house of the soul, which are the various other components of our soul. And the Levite. What is the Levite? So again, this is another mind-blowing insight. What he tells us, according again from the Zohar, is that our soul is incredibly dynamic and powerful and holy and spiritual. But in this world, we actually have access to only a minute fraction of our soul. And you see this actually in life. Kids start off and essentially all they care about is the same things that baby animals care about. They want to be fed. They want to be entertained maybe. They want to go to sleep. They want to go to the bathroom. It's all physical. They're alive, of course. They have a soul within them. But what percentage, so to speak, of the entirety of their soul do they actually have access to? It's a very small percentage. And the Zohar tells us that as someone grows and develops spiritually, they are unlocking layer upon layer, level upon level of their soul. They're leveling up so to speak, and accessing more and more of the soul that they always had, but they were just not allowed to partake in it. And of course, once they arrive at that world, they are, so to speak, reunited with the entirety of their soul. And that, of course, is a tremendously blissful experience. And finally, it's not just us. It's the proselyte. It's the convert. It's the foreigner in our midst, and again, my mind was blown again when I read this, when a person does a mitzvah, a rare mitzvah, a mitzvah that doesn't happen all the time, this is a direct quote that the Orachayim brings from the Zohar, many other souls that have already left this world and are missing a mitzvah, what that means is, is that our soul is comprised of 613 parts and every mitzvah corresponds to a different portion of our soul. As we know, there's 613 mitzvahs, and that's because it is directly mirroring our existence. Our body has 613 parts, our soul has 613 parts, and we have 613 mitzvahs, and that is because each mitzvah is designed to transform one part of our identity, to upgrade one part of our identity from being body-like, physical, material, to being spiritual. So then you have a rare mitzvah that someone hasn't fulfilled. So their soul is lacking in a particular component that is corresponding to a particular mitzvah. So what happens when someone does a unique mitzvah? There are converts. Now in Hebrew, the word ger means a convert, but it also means a foreigner. There are foreigners that actually inhabit that person's existence in the Kabbalistic lexicon, I was told. It means they become pregnant with mitzvos, And that way, those other souls can be perfected because they didn't get a chance to do that mitzvah themselves. And they got a chance, so to speak, vicariously to do the mitzvah via a different person. And when it says, Vehager Asher Bekerbecha, and the foreigner that's within you in your midst, it's actually a reference to other souls, foreign souls that are there that hitch a ride within you when you do a rare mitzvah. Maybe we could speculate. We've gone far, far off what the course of what we usually talk about. So 
I guess we can add a little bit more to that. There is a relatively rare mitzvah of sending away the mother bird before you take the chitz or the eggs. I was always told that this is a good portent for having children. If there's a family suffering God with infertility, you do this mitzvah and that's a way to be able to have children. It never made sense to me until right now. Here again, we're told by the Kabbalistic literature that when someone does a rare, unique mitzvah, other souls are inhabiting them. There is the foreigner in their midst. Maybe we could speculate. When someone does that particular mitzvah or any rare mitzvah, they become engorged with visiting souls. And maybe now they have an ability to maybe get one of those souls to stick around and maybe they could have a child. Who knows? That's my speculation. Wow, what a wild, rollicking ride in this Arachayim commentary. Maybe we could just say that a lot of the things that he talks about are quite topical. You know, we're on the cusp of the high holidays. And it's the time of the year that we like to re-examine a lot of the fundamental questions of our life. What are we living for? What are our priorities? Is our goals, our life goals, our life objectives, are they heading in the right direction, you know, where we actually want to go, and what we want to achieve in our lives? This, of course, I think does talk about it. Because the second we start thinking about what happens after we die, it does help bring a little bit of clarity to what we want to accomplish when we are indeed still alive. I thought this was worthwhile to share. There's a lot of things I didn't know here. And I also thought it was neat to see this example of the multidimensionality of Torah featured by one of the mainstream commentators. You open up a Chumash, the uh, various editions of the Chumash, you actually see the Arachayim commentary. Every year I just skipped over it. This year I read it completely and I was just so mind blown. And we see again, we have, of course, a description of someone doing a mitzvah bringing fruits, giving it to the Kohen, making a declaration. And then we see an entirely different universe of a Kabbalistic interpretation going verse by verse, explaining the entire narrative on a different dimension. I thought it was such an interesting thing and was worthwhile to share. But of course, it's packed with inspiring and topical lessons. What a way to think about mitzvos! It's fruit that we're stockpiling for the world wherein we eat, consume, enjoy those fruits. Of course, there's this idea that if we're scrutinized by God, Abraham has no chance, certainly we don't have a chance. Our deeds are few, but we learn about the nature of our foes, the nature of our adversaries. We have this wily, Laban-like adversary who wants to destroy our father, our soul. But the Almighty arms us with Torah, strong hand with all kinds of mitzvos that hopefully will enable us to extricate ourselves from this quagmire and allow us indeed to achieve an eternal and enduring portion in Alamaba in the spiritual world in the afterlife. I thank you all for listening. This was a total pleasure. I look forward to talking to you all. Next time, thank you for listening. My email address is rabbiwobajim.com. Have a great Shabbos, and thank you for listening.